Ted, you're late again. Ah, uh, sorry, my girlfriend was over. All right, let's get started. There's no way you're gonna survive this dungeon. Oh crap, I gotta level up my character here real quick. Why you're holding up my story? I think it's time to talk about the three worst ways to D&D. Welcome to Nerdarchy, for nerds by nerds. I'm Nerdark Steve, and as usual, I'm hanging out with this nerd. Nerdark is Ted. Hey, maybe it's your first time visiting Ted's Basement. It's a place where we like to discuss news, views, and homebrews for 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, sometimes we even talk about other role-playing games. So if you don't want to miss a single video, don't forget to crit hit that subscribe button and attune to that notification bell. All right, so we lied a little bit. <laughs> There's actually more than three worst ways to D&D, &D, but we're going to break it down to three worst ways for the players and three worst ways for the Dungeon Master. So, uh, you know, you said players first. We want to start there? It sounds like a good place to go. So, you know, for, for starters, I would say let's look at the overbearing player. All right. The overbearing player, in my opinion, is one of the most annoying people at the table. This is the person who always wants to tell other people how to play their characters, how to build their characters. Don't take that feat. Take this stat adjustment, whatever. They're also more likely to argue with the dungeon master about rules calls. And they just slow up the game, and I feel like they detract from the fun of the game. I'm very big on minding your own character. This is the player that's going to be like, oh, you're the last one here, and everyone has picked their character class, and we need a cleric, so you should play the cleric. Uh, they're just kind of bossy. And, and that is challenging no matter what the setting, no matter what the situation the, the player or the, the person who is inserting their opinion, not, you know, not being helpful, not being, you know, constructive, but just downright bossy and telling others what to do. It is a problem no matter the setting. Yeah, they're just dumping on the other people at the table instead of uh, engaging them and conversing with them. It's fine if you were to do it in a constructive way, like you said, and engage that player and be like, oh, that's an interesting choice. Why did you do that? And then you might be like, oh, did you know if you do this, such and such will happen? And, you know, in that way, you can kind of like you can discuss and have a conversation and they'll be like, oh, yeah, I'm not interested in that or, oh, that's a good idea. Or you can ask for permission. You know, or you wait until somebody does ask that question. So, like, if somebody is uncertain of something, it's like, oh, does anyone know how this works? Or does anyone, you know, know what this ruling is? Then you can feel free to step in and offer your opinion or offer what that rule set is. But to just shove it without, you know, care, it's problems. Yeah, pretty much, you know, the, the, the thing that that really kind of like gets my goat is when other people start telling other people how to play their characters or, or what to play. If you feel like your adventuring party needs a particular class or race combination so bad, I feel like you should be the one to play it. I can definitely agree with that. You know, there are, there are many times that you've brought up the point that you can adventure with any kind of character set or, you know, adventuring party set. You don't need to have a rogue or a cleric and it's, you know, up to, the group of how they manage without it and it's up to the dm to provide a story that meets the needs of the party not just like well you don't have a rogue so my trip my traps are just gonna you know kill y'all deal with it all right so let's move into our second number two the worst way to D, &D as a player and that is going to be the rude dude or dudette at the table uh so this is the this is the player who doesn't really have a concern for the other players and their time so, you know, as we demonstrated kind of in the beginning, where they're just late all the time. Or they don't show up. Or they don't show up, don't call, like, oh, it's, you know, 15 minutes, you know, past the time we're all supposed to, supposed to get together. You know, where's Fred? Oh, let me, let me call him. Oh, I'm sorry, guys, I can't make it tonight. You could have called and let us know when you knew that this wasn't going to happen, or, you know, text, Facebook message, however it is that you're choosing to communicate. As we get older, our time gets more precious our attention gets divided even more and it becomes even more important for us to communicate and, and try and sync up schedules. And if this is important to you, then, you know, everyone should just set aside the time and be like, Oh, well, I'm not going to schedule things during D and D night or whatever night that is, you know, whether you play once a month or once a week, respect the other people at the table. And like Ted said, let them know ahead of time. You know, we, we used to game every single Saturday night. You know, what is now Nerdarchy was initially, you know, the, the Saturday night group. 
and we let it know like we're gaming every Saturday and we would plan our work schedules, our event schedules around it. And if something were to come up, it was up to the person when something came up to notify. We had players over the years that it was a constant strain. Uh, there was one player in particular who it seemed that they were absent more than they were present. You know? And I was like, come on, either commit or, commit or not. So with that, let's get into number three, the third worst way to D&D as a player. So this is going to be the indifferent player. And what, what I mean by that is the one where they don't really care about the event itself. They're, they're not concerned with the, the actual D&D game. They're more here for, you know, some other reason. And we're not always sure what that other reason is. Like, I'm sure every group at some point or another, has had this player. They're, like, always there. They're actually the most reliable person at the table. They will always show up. Maybe they're even early. But you know what? They just don't seem to be into the game. And you ask them, hey, or you could ask them, hey, are you having fun? Oh, yeah. I, like, But even our answer seems indifferent. I, and it is just odd. Um, this, one is, this one is probably the lesser of the three. Uh-huh. Uh, it's less it's less of an inconvenience. They're just kind of there, but they don't participate either. A lot of times they'll take their turn when it's their turn and, it, you know, and then they kind of fade in into the background. And I feel like we've had several of these over the years as well. So, you you know, you, it might be the, you know, the gamer significant other that's just along for the ride. It might be someone who, you know, is trying to get into a mo- more social situation, but they don't feel follow everything that actually goes on in D&D. But I mean, you know, there's there's so many different ways to diagnose this one. It might be someone who's spending more time with uh, an electronic device at the table and they don't really care what's going on and they're like, "Oh, it's my turn. Oh, let me figure this stuff out." And now they need to know what's going on because they haven't been paying attention. It it could be like, "All right, well, I don't really do role playing, so when you guys are just talking, I'm going to pull out a book or I'm just going to kind of stare off blankly. I'll sit and doodle. I, I run games for kids and, you know, or my kids, and my daughter definitely falls into, you know, the indifferent player because she's 7. She's not quite ready to handle a 4-hour gaming session. But she wants to take part and she enjoys, you know, some of the aspects of D&D and some things she doesn't. But she's got to learn. She's got to, you know, grow and, you know, she'll hopefully grow out of this. Of our first two, um, you know, players that are, that are kind of the worst ways to D&D, those are the ones that after a, a talk and some time that are probably going to be asked to not come back. Where this one... I would you know, give a lot more leeway and and see maybe like you said maybe they're just coming out of their shell or whatever perhaps over time they'll engage more uh, maybe it's just you know their personality maybe they have problems with anxiety or other issues so this one while this one is a, a little bit of a nuisance at the table it's generally not a big deal unless they are the distracted player where it's not that they're indifferent because they just don't seem to participate or engage but because they're doing other things you know, and they're not a child. Right. <laughs> so uh, now, now I will say that, you know, all, you know, these, these types of scenarios, you know, you can engage them in a, in a one-on-one conversation and, and try and alleviate the issues, but, you know, do so with care and caution. Absolutely. So next up, we're going to do the worst ways to D and D as the dungeon master. But before we do, <laughs> we are going to jump into our sponsor segment and we want to thank Grim Hollow Ghostfire Gaming for sponsoring this video. They got a Kickstarter going on right now. They're doing awesome. Almost 200% funded, over a thousand backers. Uh, there's a great video that tells you all about their Kickstarter, and they say it with an Australian accent. I love the Australian accent. <laughs> the Kickstarter, besides being an, an awesome, you know, grim, dark, you know, fantasy setting, it's going to come with a lot of awesome features. Number one, you can run the adventures and the encounters that are already pre-built there, or there's stuff to take as inspiration so that you can run your own grim, dark setting of your own. The background system, I'm really intrigued to see what they have because they're talking about, you know, taking the profession 
into an account to make a more expansive character creation scenario. Uh, and that that's exciting to me. I'd love to see how, how they go about doing that, maybe making some new choices. Uh, they've already unlocked their first stretch goal, which is adding some new spells. And let's face it, you know, always oh, new spells are always a great thing. There's rules for creating player characters as vampires and liches, which I'm intrigued to see how uh, what their take is on that one, because I think that's going to be really cool as well. They're closing in on that second stretch goal, and a couple stretch goals down, you know, they're going to have rules for playing fiends and lycanthropes. So I'm excited to see that one. You know, Ted's like, how do you become a thief? fiend <laughs> and i think in a lot of the lore a lot of the fiends start off immortal anyway so that could definitely work it could be cool you talked about you know you know it talks about how to run or to run the campaign setting itself it also introduces new mechanics for that so there's a lot of things going on in this campaign setting even if you're not into the campaign itself i feel like there's going to be a lot of rules that you're going to be able to take out of that mechanics that you're going to be able to introduce into your world if you want to play that grim dark kind of kind of uh gritty fantasy so do us a favor check out the kickstarter support us by supporting our sponsors all right first up we've got whose story is it anyway this is always a, a significant challenge when it comes to you know sitting at a table i'm certain that you've you've seen games before where you know players sit down and they're engaged in the story but the dm is more you know narrating and monologuing and it's more about their story than what it is that the players are doing. And I feel that these kinds of games are a challenge because they're not as engaging. Yeah, the players don't feel like they have any stake. They're not, they don't feel like they're involved in it. Uh, and this is we're not even talking about a railroady or I prefer the term lateral style adventure either. We're, you know, we're talking about where the GM has their set story that they feel like they need to tell. And they're going to do things and use plot devices and plot armor and all kinds of things to make sure that story gets out there. I mean, there's the meme about, you know, I'm thinking about playing D&D, but I'm not going to have any players. I'm just going to do everything myself. And like someone's like, yeah, I think that's called writing a novel. <laughs> So, you know, with these type of, of games, it's more about the story. You know, NPCs that are there. Um, it is, but in the wrong way, right? It's supposed to be a cooperative game. And it is, you, you can t it should be about the story, but it should be about the story that we're all telling together. You know, we're here to, as the dungeon master to facilitate a story for the players to tell. So when, when the NPC becomes unkillable or, you know, new scenarios arrive so that, you know, you are forced to go in, in a direction or make choices that your characters wouldn't necessarily make, you know, th those moments become challenging. Now, there is a difference between, oh, I'm running a module and this is where the story is, so how can I coax you to go in there? And just as like, oh, well, you know, you step out of town in this homebrew game and, well, we're going to go left. Well, no, no, you can't go left. You got to go right. Why? Because you got to go right. Like, th there's things that make it, you know, far more challenging on the player. And it and it's when the, you take away, you know, their narrative control that that's where it gets into the, this is my story. Forget challenging it's just less fun, you know, it's less enjoyable. So with that, let's move on to our second worst way to D&D as the Dungeon Master. So this is going to be your authoritarian Dungeon Master. This is the one where, like, they are they are the Dungeon Master. I am in control. I am the, you know, the absolute abjector of all of the rules, and you will do as I say. And, and this, you know, presents a whole new array of challenges. This is the Dungeon Master that is more likely to say, this is my story. They're going to talk about my game a lot. And they, you know, very much like the, the you know, the my story GM, but, it, you know, in different directions. You know, maybe they do let you do what you want, but at the end of the day, like, they're very, like, they're going to change all the rules in the game a lot of times. They may not tell you about it. It's like, it's my game. I don't care. There is going to be no back and forth, no negotiating with how the game was going to operate. Um, if they do do a session zero, their session zero is going to be very much about uh, having an opportunity to tell you 
everyone at the table how the game is going to go, and they're not going to accept your input into the game at all. They are very likely to not be very uh, co-optive in how they play the game. You know, when that session zero happens, they're probably going to come to the table with a already prepared document of, you know, well, here is, the, here is the game, here is the house rules that I'm using for this particular game. I'm not going to allow these races or I'm not going to allow these classes, um, you know, or maybe even like, you know, these type of combos don't work in my, in my world, in my game, what have you. And they're going to present you, potentially bombard you with all of this information that is going to, in my opinion, you know, steal, you know, more, more of your player choice. Now, we actually had an early GM that was very much kind of like this, and we would make the joke that the two worst things was he didn't like your character, <laughs> because then bad things were just going to happen to your character, or he did like your character, and you know he was going to try and take control of your character and make choices for you whether you wanted to or not so that the best place to be was unnoticed <laughs> you know you know case case in point you know i made a you know just a standard fighter and his goal was he wanted to be a general he wanted to lead an army and the way i role played him you know the dm really loved it so he's like well i'm gonna supplant your idea of be a general and i'm gonna try to force you to sit on a throne and you're gonna be the king it's like but that, that means I got to go handle all of the politic nonsense that I want nothing to do about. I want to control men who are led into battle or people led into battle. I, I you know, this is my thirst. This is my dream. No, nope, doesn't matter. I, I, I like where you're going with this and I'm changing where you're going with this. So with that, we move into number three, and that was the Brutal GM. This could also be considered the adversarial dungeon master. So, you know, here we have a GM that, you know, it's it's more about the challenge of, you know, combat and, you know, player hit hit points, that that life and death scenario. And to an extent, they really don't care about your character and your goals. You know, look, I'm on this side of the screen, you're on that side of the screen, and it's my job to challenge you and kill you because if if I don't kill a character every so often, then you aren't gonna feel threatened. You aren't gonna feel like, you know, your lives are really in danger. So therefore, every so often, people just have to die. This GM probably celebrates after a TPK. It's brutal, it's hard. I've never been this type of DM, but I've I've sat on the other side and I've questioned like, all right, you know, is this a scenario like this? You know, am I am I worried about this? And you know, it's something that makes it very hard to really, you know, engage the the character role playing and the the character goals because you don't know if you're ever going to get there. Yeah, they're the type of GM that are going to really embrace save or suck effects. I feel like this type of GM is actually molded you know, where the additions of Dungeons and Dragons have gone from the beginning and moved away from those as mm -hmm. well. Not only would they embrace save or suck, but they absolutely love save or die type effects. And that's their bread and butter. And I feel like this is the kind of dungeon master that would bring them back for fifth edition D and D. So, I mean, and there's, there's a number of, you know, fatalistic uh, monsters and spells that exist with, within the 5e rule set. Um, you know, Vargoyles are, are disgusting. Intellect Devours, the spell Disintegrate, all of these things have the ability to just out and out kill a character. And, you know, some of these things can even be a low-level encounter. But, you know, I, I urge DMs who are considering using them to be incredibly careful and incredibly cautious when using them because they do have those scenarios where, you know, a few poor choices or one bad saving throw... And that character's gone. And there's you know, no easy or real recovery from it. So the question is, what are some of the worst ways you've seen the D&D? &D? We got a place where you can tell us all about it down in the comments below. But before we head on out, I want to take a moment to invite you to join Nerdarchy the Adventuring Party over on Patreon. Ted, what can they expect over there? We're creating products for 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons that players and DMs alike can drop right into their game. But that's not all. Every month we do giveaways and our patrons are automatically entered. We do weekly hangouts with our patrons and more. So quest on down to the description. Join the Nerdarchy Adventuring Party on Patreon. Until next time, stay, stay nerdy. nerdy.